Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and today we're going to be talking about strategies to help you manage your energy and avoid burnout as a coach. Now, very excited about this topic. It's something that I've thought a lot about over the last 23 years, and if nothing else, I'm excited to talk about it because this is actually the second time I'm recording the show. I don't know what I did the first time. I'm obviously using a new piece of software to try and capture the audio and the video, give you a little bit more bang for your buck. But man, I don't know if I had the mute button hit, if something got loose on my computer, if something just screwed up on the back end. No idea, but let's all take a moment and thank my guy, Paul Rutan, for taking the time to <laughs> fix all my mistakes, all the issues that I have with the show. Truly appreciate that guy. He is just an absolute lifesaver. So originally, I had titled this show, How to Manage Your Energy as a Coach and Show Up at an Elite Level Every Day. Now, not necessarily a bad title, but a little on the wordy side and maybe doesn't get to the root of what we're looking at here. At the end of the day, as trainers, as coaches, we have to learn how to manage our energy and we have to avoid burnout. We're in a very energy intensive world. Every time you go in the gym, it's expected of you. You're going to lift your people up. You're going to help get a little bit more out of them. You're going to push them to new levels. And while all that's great, just know and understand that that can take a toll on us as coaches, as human beings. It can be very, very tiring. So I think this is a really salient discussion that if we start having it now, if you're a young coach, or if you've been in this game for 15, 20, 25 years like I have, it's going to help you maintain and continue to coach at a high level for as long as you'd like. So before we get into some of these actionable items and strategies that we're going to cover, I want to start by giving you an overview of kind of just my philosophy when it comes to coaching. And I really have three goals when it comes to coaching or delivering a great session. The first one is that I want to have the same level of training for every client every hour of the day. So it doesn't matter if I'm training somebody at 8 a.m. in the morning, noon, 3 p.m. It doesn't matter if they're a Gen Pop client or an elite level athlete that plays in the NBA or the MLS. None of that matters to me. If you are watching me from afar, you should be able to watch every single workout and see a pretty even and steady approach to coaching. I don't want it to be like, oh, wow, you can tell he's with an NBA client here. Or, oh, man, you can really tell he's with a gym pop client here. He doesn't enjoy that as much. And it, it shouldn't matter whether that person is maybe a high school athlete or a college athlete or a, a professional athlete. My goal is that at any hour with any client, any athlete, the coaching is it's performed and executed at a very high level. Now, not always saying that's easy, but that's the goal. That's one goal. Second, I want to have this blend of coaching and caring. Now, if you listen to this episode, if you followed my kind of career path and all the things that I've talked about, I've created a lot of content around coaching, around program design, about being elite at what we do. But I think the best coaches find a way to marry these two things. They find a way to marry those hard skills like coaching, cueing, program design. They take all those items and then they merge it with the human element of what we do. They let their clients and athletes know that they love them, that they care about them, that they're pouring their own energy into them because they want to see them succeed. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people may not understand. If you've never come into iFast, if you've never watched me coach, yeah, I'd like to think I do things technically at a high level, but there's a lot of just back-end rapport building, communication, just you know, trying to learn more about them as human beings that I think really helps me be successful. So that's the second item. And then third, I want to be the best part of their day every day they come in the gym. Now, obviously, if you've got kids or you love your sport or you love your job, I might not be the best part of your day, but I definitely don't want it to be the worst part of your day. I don't even want it to be a, a, just a so-so part of your day. If you come into the gym and you work with me, I want it to be one of the best parts of your day every single day. And especially when you do this in the private sector, you realize, hey man, if you're not on your A game, if you're not delivering at a high level, your clients, your athletes, they have choices. They don't have to train with you. So I think this is really, really important. You have to know and understand that 
man, if you want people to keep coming back, you have to be a great part of their day every time they come in the gym. So those are three things that I'm always thinking about. So when we take that to the next level, and I, I hold myself to a very high standard when I'm coaching my clients and athletes, I have to think about, okay, well, how do I set myself up for success every single day? And when you look at what the best athletes in the world do, they train at a high level, they fuel their body appropriately, they get enough sleep, they work on their mindset, their meditation. These are all things that I try and do, but not to go out and perform on a field quarter pitch, but to do it when I come into the gym. So I think if you're really serious about this, if you want to really develop your craft and you want to coach at a high level for a long period, you have to start thinking of yourself as an elite athlete. And how do you set yourself up to coach at a high level? So it's a shift in mindset because I think a lot of times we preach these things to the clients and athletes we work with, but we're not always the best at adhering to these items ourselves. So that's something I'm always thinking about is how do I take the best care of myself, not only so I feel good, but so that ultimately I can perform at a high level when I step on the gym floor. Another comment that I want to put up front here, because I think it's very, very salient and important as well, is this idea of being able to perform at a high level in the short term versus the long term. I'm not interested in coaching at a high level for a year or two years. You know, I'm 23 years in. I don't know how long I'll coach, but I'd like to think I've got at least another 15 to 20 in me. And again, I don't know, like I haven't thought about that. I'm not going to put an end date on it, but I'm trying to think, how do I set myself up for success so I can continue to coach at a high level? If this is maybe your first or second year in, sure, there are strategies you can use. If you're working a split shift, man, you can get up at 5 a.m. and go to work at 6 and grind and, you know, overly caffeinate yourself. Uh, there's shortcuts. There's hacks that you can use, but they're not going to set you up for long-term success. Eventually, right? You're going to get stressed out. You're going to get burned out. So I want you to think about how do we set yourself up, not just for success in the short term, but how do we start to cultivate these long-term habits to help you coach at the highest level? And then last but not least, I think today's show is a blend of really short-term actionable items, things that you can use today, but then also some philosophy on the back end. We're going to talk about if you go home tonight, what are things you can start doing right now today to set yourself up for success tomorrow? But on a grander scale, you have to start thinking about bigger picture items, right? Like you might not think about it, but how does the workspace in your gym impact your energy level? How do the people you have in your life impact your energy level? Uh, you know, if you haven't taken a vacation in the last year or two, how is that negatively impacting your energy level, and your ability to go in the gym and perform at a high level. So I think that's my goal here today is I want to give you some short-term actionable items because I love shows like that. Something short-term, something actionable that will really get things going and things I can take action on and start working on today. Those are great. But also on the back end, I want the philosophical stuff. Like what are the things that I need to be setting up over the long term to set myself up for success? So that's what we're going to cover uh, if you're listening, we're going to take a quick break. If you're watching, we're going to take a quick break. And then we're going to jump into this awesome episode and talk about how to manage your energy and avoid burnout as a coach. Okay, let's rock. Let's start by talking about our daily agenda items. And just to start this off, a lot of times we're talking about the training day. But like most things in life, a great day really starts the night before. So if you want to coach at a high level on Monday, the game starts Sunday night. And I think one of the most impactful things you can do, this was really highlighted to me today, is get a great night's sleep. It's redundant. I know you've heard about this all the time, probably heard so many people drone on and on sleep, sleep, blah, blah, blah. It's important. If it wasn't important, we wouldn't talk about it so much. Also, just because it's important doesn't mean we're actually doing it. So sleep is an absolute game changer for me. And this was highlighted for me today. You know, I'm kind of getting into that really, like, not summer yet, but I'm getting into that late end of school year grind where the kids have a ton of stuff going on. Kate gets up early for school. I got Ed in at 8 a.m. 
coaching all morning, doing stuff like this in the afternoon. In the evenings, I'm either watching Kindle practice or coaching Cade. Like tonight, Cade got a baseball game. He won't get done till 9.15. So there's a lot going on. And so if I don't take care of my sleep, if I don't check that box regularly, I start to see a negative impact. And so last night, one of those nights, I wanted to stay up. I wanted to watch that Celtics Miami game, but you know what? Got to midnight or midnight. It got to halftime, and I was exhausted. I'm trying to read a book, I'm literally falling asleep while I'm reading a book. Just put the book down, went to bed, got seven and a half hours sleep. We'll talk about the the magic of the seven and a half hours later on. But man, I literally woke up before my alarm, felt ref- refreshed, felt rested, and I had a great day of coaching today. So. For starters, you got to get enough sleep. And when we start talking about sleep or when I'm trying to help clients, athletes get better sleep, there's two fronts or two battles that I'm trying to wage here. The first one, we're talking about sleep quality because I think that is the easier thing to manage early on. So if you want to improve somebody's sleep quality, a couple easy things that you can do. Number one, change the environment. If you got the ability, if you have the means, get blackout blinds. I mean, we've got like the thickest blinds you can imagine. It's a little bit harder now because obviously summertime's coming, the sun is up earlier, but the darker you can make your room, the better. Second, the cooler you can make your room, the better. For years, we used to sleep at 72 degrees and I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm always hot. You know, I've got like the thinnest sheet possible on me. But if I woke up, it'd be hard to fall back asleep. So a cool, dark environment, absolutely critical. A third thing that I think has been absolute game changer for me is creating a pre-bed routine. This is something I talk about extensively in my RTS annual program, but I've basically got a 90 minute window that allows me to set the stage for a good night's sleep. So let's say bedtime is 1030 at nine o'clock. I'm doing my best to shut all the electronics off unless the playoffs are on. I'll get a little, give myself a little bit of wiggle room at this time of year, but turn the electronics off, take a hot bath, hot shower, something to just help myself kind of reset, decompress, rewind. And then when I'm done, I'll do some resets. I'll do some breathing activities. I'll do some stretching exercises. You know, just really try and unwind, uh, reconnect with my body a little bit. And then I generally still have 45 minutes to an hour. That's where I'm just going to chill out. I'm going to (laughs) read. It's funny. We did that show with Ebony Rio a couple weeks ago now. And Ebony was so great. You know, she asked, oh, well, what are you reading, Mike? What do you enjoy? And I was kind of embarrassed because there's plenty of nights where I don't read anything of substance. I'm reading a comic book or I'm reading a Star Wars Legends novel, like something that's just almost brainless, but just really allows me to shut my brain off, chill out and relax. So I think having a pre-bed routine really helps set the stage for a great night's sleep. For me, zinc and magnesium before bed, magnesium is just a lifesaver. You know, I started that years and years ago, back with the old T Nation ZMA, and I just can't move off it because I can see a huge difference. If I don't take it for a couple of weeks and then I start it back into my my program about an hour before bed, it's a huge, huge boon to my sleep quality. And I've got aura ring scores that back it up. I see an increase in my rim and increase in my deep sleep. So magnesium for me is a big one. But set the stage. A quality sleeping environment will really set the stage for great quality sleep. Now, the second part of this is quantity. And and this is a little bit harder to to finagle sometimes because some people just don't want to go to bed. So the easiest answer here is stop messing around, take your ass to bed. (laughs) That is the easiest way to do it. But sometimes that's hard and I get that. And we'll talk about strategies later on in the show where maybe if you don't get enough sleep during the week, maybe you're just getting like six hours of sleep during the week, how you can stock up on the back end of your week and maybe fill in some of those gaps. But sleep is a huge one. The other piece of kind of my my night before uh, setup, if you will, is planning my next day. And this is something that I took from Dan Kennedy years ago. If you've never heard of Dan Kennedy, he's like this brilliant master marketer type. And so obviously when I'm running, especially the gym, I got to know marketing, but Dan's just like this wealth of just like personal development, how to manage your day, structure your time, and just loved his thoughts. But he always talked about planning your day the night before and really being regimented about, okay, what am I trying to get done? 
what's most important, what's most impactful. But really two things happen. When you plan your day the night before, number one, it allows your brain to shut off. Instead of thinking about the 30 agenda items that you feel like you have to do tomorrow, a lot of times when you take them out of your brain and you get them on a piece of paper, immediately your day is easier to manage. What also tends to happen is what you feel like are 30 agenda items are really about five that you just keep recycling throughout the day. But because you haven't taken the time to actually write them down, it feels like you have like 30 things to do. So planning your day helps you decompress. It helps you relax. But the other thing that's very, very cool about this is that when you write down your day or maybe you outline an article, whatever the case may be, when you set this agenda for yourself, I firmly believe your brain, your operating system is working in the background that entire night. So while you're sleeping, your brain is writing that article or it's writing that program. So it's just one of those simple things you can do. If you plan your day the night before, I feel like immediately it sets the stage for less anxiety, less stress, and ultimately better coaching sessions the following day. So great coaching starts the night before. Second, when it gets to the morning, what do we do, right? Do you just, you know, get a cup of coffee, sprint out the door and start coaching? No, I think you set yourself up for success that morning as well. It starts by fueling yourself appropriately. And again, a lot of the things that we give as advice to our clients, to our athletes, are things we need to be sticking to ourselves, things that we need to be doing a better job of ourselves. So for many, many years, I probably ate way too few carbohydrates. And I realize anytime we talk about nutrition, it can get murky. So I'm just going to tell you what works for me and just know and understand the goal is always to figure out what works best for you. So for me, when I started working with Cody, with Trevor from Taylor Coaching Method, they started doing like an audit of what I needed to work on, how to better fuel my body. Very clear, I needed to get a better blend of protein, carbohydrates, and fats at every meal because what I was lacking in carbohydrates, that energy I wasn't getting from there, I was trying to refuel and replenish via caffeine or other sources. So for me, finding a better blend, getting more carbohydrates throughout the day, but especially at breakfast, made a huge impact for me and my energy levels. So really important when we're talking about fueling, you got to start your day off right. Make sure you're getting a high quality breakfast in. Second, hopefully you know you should get a good breakfast, but how else can we set ourselves up for success on the coaching floor? A second piece of advice that I would strongly recommend is start reviewing your sessions before you go into the gym. This is a huge one, I'm telling you. So if I'm training Ed and Keelan and Dakota and you know Taya and whoever else that morning, what I wanna do is review all of their sessions. I wanna look at, okay, what, a, what is Ed working on this day? What am I focused on with him? Is it his pelvic position? Is it his foot contacts? Is it his ability to yield? Start thinking about exactly how you want that session to look and feel. Now, this is also important because if you do any sort of rehab or any type of return to play. Unfortunately, not everybody is on the perfect up and up every single session. I mean, I wish it was. I would be the greatest return to play coach of all time. But invariably, sometimes there are setbacks or sometimes they come in and their knees a little bit sore, their backs a little bit stiff. So reviewing that session and then starting to think about contingencies can make a huge, huge impact on the performance in your session. So I'm just thinking yesterday, I'm not going to share the gentleman's name, but we are going through a session and, you know, we went hard on Monday. We did a lot of stuff that he hadn't done in a long time. We did some force plate testing, some jumping that he hadn't done. His numbers were going up, all of his performance movements, right? The things that are important to get him back on the court are, are better. But he came in a couple of days later. He's like, yo, like, I'm just going to be honest. My knee's a little bit sore, which I want him to tell me. I never want him to hide that sort of thing from me. So, you know, I'd reviewed his program. I knew what the goals were for that day. We modified the exercises just a little bit to work around some of that knee soreness. And voila, we had a great coaching session. And not only did we have a great coaching session, but he walked out feeling way better than when he walked in. So reviewing your sessions, thinking about contingency plans and how to, how to just better manage your, your sessions will make a huge impact on your actual coaching. 
And then the third piece of your AM routine should be being on Lombardi time. So if you're unfamiliar with Lombardi time, Lombardi time is this. If you're 15 minutes early, you're on time. And if you're on time, you're late. So this is something I adhere to, to the absolute best of my ability. When I'm going into coach, if I start at 8 a.m., I want to be there at 745. And here's why. It's not just to be there early and hang out and then stare at my phone for 15 minutes. Those 15 minutes are to get the shakes made, get the equipment set up, get all my programs pulled. Like literally, if I'm there 15 minutes early, the entire morning is set up for me and I'm ready to rock. If I don't do that, then when my eight o'clock shows up, you know, he's done at 915, 930. Now I have to go make his shake while the other guy's warming up. Or maybe he's already or she is already into R4 in their workout. So now it's like I'm trying to make a shake. I'm trying to, you know, coach and cue this person. I also got to go to the bathroom because I drank like two cups of coffee in the morning. It's just not a great way to start your coaching day. So if you get there early, you do all those things, all the little like, uh, maintenance and setup type pieces are already done, boom, you're ready to go in and have a great day of coaching. So starts with the night before, but then when you get there and you're ready to rock in the morning, now you're really set up for success. So we talked about the night before, we talked morning of, now let's talk about optimizing your workspace. And I realize this may sound kind of random, right? But this is something that I've really focused on the last couple years, whether it's at the gym, whether it's at home, making sure the workspace really kind of beckons me. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but you got to love being in your workspace. So like I set up this whole creation now where I've got like a bigger monitor, I've got better lights, you know, I've got like the fancy keyboard mouse now. So like, I want to come in here and work. I want to come in and create content, write articles, uh, create my outlines for podcasts like this. But in the gym, I think that same vibe is there. Like you want to take great care of your gym. You want to optimize that workspace. So, you know, when we first opened iFast, the vibe that I wanted to put off was that this is a hardcore training facility and not hardcore in the sense that it's like scary, but like this is where people come to get better. And it could be young athletes. It could be professional athletes. It can be gen pop clients that want to shed body fat, build muscle. It could be retired folks that just want to move and feel better. I just want that vibe when they come in to be like, no, this is a place where people come and they get better. But in that same breath, what I didn't want was this vibe where you're going to get all those things, but you're going to get a communicable disease, right? Because I've been in some of the coolest gyms in the planet, right? I think about like the original West Side Barbell, maybe not the original, original that was in like Louis Garage, but like the one that was 800 square feet. I got to train there a couple times. Amazing. Uh, I believe there was another one in Connecticut called Southside Gym. I know Eric Cressy and Tony Genocore took me there once or twice. Like I love training in those gyms, but at the same time, I'm not like trying to scare people off, right? And I don't want them to feel like they're going to catch some sort of disease from being in there. So I want them to have that hardcore training feel, but in a gym that looks clean. It looks nice. It looks like it's been well taken care of. And the perpetual intern, Eric Huddleston, uh, who I did a show with years ago, former iFaster, he did this really cool thing. Like he interned with us and then he knew he wanted to be in basketball. So he interned with us and then he went and spent a summer with Texas Tech basketball and he interned there. And then he went to IU and he spent like the entire basketball season there interning with them. So then when he came back to iFast, he had this term and he called it recruit ready because at these big schools, you want your gym to look recruit ready all the time, right? You don't want a big name. Imagine a five-star recruit comes into your gym and it just craps everywhere, right? Like the plates are on the floor. There's chalk everywhere. It's dirty. You know, the dumbbells are laying on the ground. Like nobody wants to see that. So we adopted this term at IFAST. We call it recruit ready. And we want our gym at any point in time to look like, hey, if like a five-star blue chip basketball player came in or an NBA player came in, it looks immaculate. It looks like this is a place I would come in and I'd get great results. So I'm always thinking about recruit ready. I want the floor mopped or swept. Uh, I want, you know, all the, the, the dumbbells set up in a certain way. I want the rack set up in a certain way. And again, it may seem a little bit anal retentive, but I feel like those little things make such a big impact because now when our clients come in, they know right where everything is. 
They know where the AirX pads are. They know where the monkey foot is. They know where the attachments are for the cable machine. So I think having a clean gym really helps just reduce stress. It reduces anxiety. It makes you feel better about your entire workday. A second piece that goes along with this is music. And I'm a big believer that good music drives great energy. And I'm also a big believer that it's very hard for us as coaches to bring like this super high level energy every single day. There are some coaches that can do that. They are anomalies and man, kudos to them. I wish I could be one of them, but I know there are certain days where I don't have as much energy and as much juice as others. That's where I can, you know, just turn the music up a little bit, right? Like find some really good tunes, something that resonates with that person, crank it up a little bit, and it just gives the entire room and the entire gym a little bit more juice. As far as music rules go, man, there's this cardio station. It's literally just called Cardio on Spotify. If you just want like general upbeat dance, uh, EDM type music, that's great. Classic rock for our, some of our morning clients, they really love, you know, like that class, classic rock era, Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, all that stuff. Others really love hip hop. You know, obviously I work in basketball. A lot of basketball players like hip hop. So whatever you choose, something that it's got to be upbeat and it's got to be energetic. And then I'll tell you about really the only rule that I have. I call it the Larry Austin rule. And Larry Austin is legitimately one of my favorite athletes. I love this guy. Uh, I think he came from Ed or or maybe Joey referred Larry, but man, Larry's just awesome. He's He is that guy that's always got energy. He's always smiling. He's always getting the best out of people. But man, I let Larry pick music like two different times at the old gym. And man, like every other word was a cuss word. So I told Larry, look, whatever you do, third time or your third strike means you're out. So you get one more chance. I said, whatever kind of music you want, pick it and then put the word clean after it. So that's the Larry Austin rule. He loved Migos. So he would always play Migos clean. And man, it was bangers. It was bangers the entire day. So whatever you choose in my gym or hopefully your gym, if it's a family friendly environment, make sure that they use the word clean and then you should be good to go. Although sometimes even those stations can be a little sus. You got to make sure that the little E doesn't creep up on some of those songs. So optimizing your workspace, hugely important. Now, I'm kind of thinking this, thinking of this entire show sequentially throughout the day. And as you go through your day, especially if you're a new trainer, or if you're a full-time trainer, or you work in a certain environment, a lot of us have to work split shifts. Not the best thing for energy management, but let's talk about how we navigate that. And I think a big portion of this is what you do in the middle of your day. So let's say you coached all morning, you crushed it, you had amazing sessions. The last thing you want to do is come out on the back half of your day and ride the struggle bus. So how do we manage our energy there? Well, first, we got to fuel ourselves. Again, an appropriate lunch, mixture of protein, carbohydrates, fats, whatever works best for you. For me, I know it makes a huge difference when I'm meal prepping on the weekends. So if I've got everything batch cooked, whether it's chicken or pork tenderloin, rice, potatoes, veggies, man, I can just knock all those out. I can weigh it, measure it. It's in my lunch bag, and I know I'm going to have a great lunch ready to go. So make sure you're fueling yourself. The second piece that's been huge for me personally is meditating midday. So I've recently gotten back into more of like this split shift type setup. It's not a true split shift because I'm not working crazy early or crazy late, but I've still got a gap in the middle of the day between when my pros come in and when some of my high school kids come in. So to help manage this, what I'll do is like, let's say I have an hour in the middle of the day, I'll do all my coaching, I'll have my lunch. And then as soon as I'm done with lunch, I'm out in my car and I'll meditate for 15 to 20 minutes. And it doesn't matter, uh, what app you use or what works best for you, Headspace, Calm. I've been using some of the Aura Ring uh, meditations that they have. Sometimes it's just like background noise for 15, 20 minutes. Whatever works for you is fine, but find a way to get away and just decompress. I think, again, personally, this has made such an impact for me because what I would tend to do on the back end of my day is, oh, well, I'm tired. I should just go get more caffeine, right? Like go to Starbucks, you know, double espresso, whatever the case was. Uh, When Tony Giuliano was here, we used to call it Tall Pike Tuesday because I would have the Indy 11 come in Tuesday afternoons. 
I want to make sure, man, I got 20, 25 guys coming in. I don't want to be flat. So we'd have Tall Pike Tuesday, 250 milligrams of caffeine. It's amazing how much more energy you have in a session. But again, it's not always sustainable. So meditating midday has greatly improved my energy level on the back end of my day, as well as just making me feel clearer and more refreshed. So when I'm in those sessions, I know exactly what I want to get out of them. And I'm just really on point throughout the entire session. Now, a couple other notes that I want to make here. Number one, if you're working split shifts, you got you to gotta just admit there's going to be some ebbs and flows in your energy level, right? It's not always going to be steady eddy throughout the day, uh, but do your best. Instead of having this throughout the day, have just like these little rises and falls throughout the day. And to do that, one of the things I feel like you have to do, again, to be successful over the long term, is limit caffeine. Now, I'm saying this from a place of deep respect because I respect you as a human being and I can respect the fact that I did not do this for large swaths uh, of my early career. When we opened iFast, I can remember the days where, all right, I'm going to have you know a cup or two of coffee when I get up because I want to be on point. I got 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. I want to be great for them. But then like midday, you got the midday lull and then I'd have a whole nother shift starting at like two or three in the afternoon. And I actually had my first two and only two figure competitors at the gym when we first opened. Their names were Alana and Brandy. They were amazing. And man, they were just high energy people. They love to train. They love to get after it. And Alana would often bring like this venti Americano, a venti iced Americano in at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, if you know anything about iced Americanos, especially at Starbucks, that's like 300, 400 milligrams of caffeine. So I'm getting three, 400 milligrams of caffeine in at three o'clock in the afternoon. And then for some reason, I would wonder, hmm, wonder why I don't sleep much at night or why I don't sleep well at night. So obviously trying to get a little bit smarter as I age. If you want to do this for the long haul and you want to avoid the burnout, get off the caffeine. And I'm not going to say get off it entirely because I enjoy caffeine. I love coffee. I love the the culture of it, maybe more than the caffeine side of it now, but you know, limit your caffeine, have it in the morning, try and minimize it afternoon. Or if you are going to have it afternoon, you know, the earlier you can have it in the day, the better, because remember the great day starts the night before. So if you're not sleeping well, because you're taking in too much caffeine, it's going to work against you. Eventually it's going to catch up to you. And, you know, again, I'm just thinking back to 2008 when we opened that gym, man, there were days I was in there at four 30 in the morning couldn't sleep. I'm just going to get up early. I'd be in there just blaring white snake, crushing programs. Like I thought I was invincible. And then three, four years later, I started running blood work and saw what it was doing to my body. And I was like, I am not invincible. In fact, on the inside, my body is not working anywhere near how I would like it to. So just from one coach to another, if you are living on caffeine, try and find ways to start hedging your bet, start cutting it back. In fact, what I do in a lot of cases now is I half cap everything. So even if I'm having, uh, you know, an Americano in the morning, it's half calf. If I'm having anything like I got uh, a little coffee here, this is decaf, right? Because I'm recording this in the afternoon. So you can find ways to enjoy the taste, to enjoy the coffee culture side of it without just absolutely destroying your adrenals in the process. So limit your caffeine. And then one other thing I'd like to recommend midday, especially in your gap, you know, if you want to, you know, get on Instagram or get on social media for a little bit, that's cool. Enjoy that. But also find ways to just recharge yourself in the middle of the day. So, you know, I'd love to just turn my phone off, maybe go for a quick walk. Or if I don't have time for that, I'll meditate and then I'll just sit outside for five minutes, you know, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the warm air, just kind of recharge, re-energize myself, reconnect with my body, with nature, because I feel like when I do those things, it immediately sets me up for more success throughout the day. So just find things that work for you, right? Find things that work to help you recharge your batteries in the middle of the day so that you can go and crush it on the back half of your day. So those are like daily agenda items. Now I want to talk about some weekly items. So if we think daily, weekly, and then monthly or semi-regularly, when we're talking about our weekly items, there are a couple things we have to be doing on a regular basis to manage or improve our energy and avoid burnout. A big one is training ourselves. And you would never tell your training clients not to train, 
right? But it's weird because in a lot of cases, as trainers, as coaches, who's the last person to get a program written for them? Who's the last person to get their coaching session in or their training session in? It's you, right? And I know because I'm in this space. You know, this happened last week to me. I did a really poor job of planning, number one. Second, I agreed to basically go be a chaperone for Cade's trip to the zoo, which no way I was going to miss that. I'd rather sacrifice a, a coaching session and have that time with my son that I'll never get back. I'll make that trade. But going forward, it just reminded me, look, you can't just hope to get training sessions. In. You have to plan your training sessions. and You have to get them on your calendar just like you would any other coaching session. Okay, so you got to train yourself. And, you know, it drives me insane because I get like when you're 30, 40, 50 years old, if you're a trainer as a coach, your training probably isn't as as important to you as the success of the people you work with, right? Like I'm not out there trying to crush PRs and my squat bench and deadlift anymore. I'm cool with that. But that also doesn't mean I stop training myself entirely because when I'm training and when I'm pushing myself in the gym, a lot of things happen. Number one, confidence goes up, right? When you're in the gym and you're crushing yourself, maybe not crushing, but when you're pushing yourself in the gym, immediately your confidence goes up. You just feel better about yourself. There's more energy. But what I also find is that these are my best times for coming up with content, whether it's articles, whether it's podcasts, whether it's video clips for IG or YouTube. When I'm training, it just gets the, that creative part of my brain going like, oh man, I'm doing this. This would make for a great video. It just helps you stimulate those thoughts. And sometimes it helps you organize some of your thoughts. So it's great for content creation for me. But I'll also tell you, man, if I'm not training regularly, I am a cranky SOB. Like I'm not a fun person to be around. And I kind of felt it at the end of last week. You know, it got to Thursday, Friday. I move a lot. I'm up walking around and I'm doing things because I'm in a gym and I'm coaching a lot. But there's a difference between just moving and actually training or pushing yourself in the gym. So I know I've got to do that to be at my best for myself, for my family, for my, you know, clients and athletes. I want to be at my best. So I got to train to do that. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, like we said up front, you can't just hope to get it on the calendar, right? You can't hope to fit a training session in. You have to schedule your workouts just like you would the coaching sessions you would for your clients and athletes. So you got to train yourself. Another one, and this is this is so important. Uh, Andy McCloy and I talked about this when we did the complete coach seminar at his gym in Huntsville last year. One of the young coaches was really concerned with burnout, um, and she'd probably been in the game three to five years. I would assume she's fairly young, uh, but this is again, this is a really relevant topic, and a lot of people are talking about burnout. So how do we manage it? Well, I think one of the best ways to avoid burnout at any stage in your career is to continue to push you, is to continue to push yourself intellectually. And here's what I mean by that. If you have been in the game 20 years and you have had the same year of experience 20 times, right? Because you've never grown, you've never evolved. You're still doing the same stuff you were doing 20 years ago. Yeah, I could imagine it would be easy to get burned out, to get bored, to not enjoy your work because you're not stimulating yourself. You're not challenging yourself. So if you want to continue to grow and evolve and keep your mind sharp and enjoy this game for the long haul, you have to find ways to challenge yourself. You have to pursue greatness in your own sense of that word. So it doesn't matter what type of training you like to do, right? Fat loss, hypertrophy, sport performance, maybe like pure strength sports. Every every one of those realms is getting bigger. It's getting better. There's more stuff to learn and know about. So why wouldn't you challenge yourself? So I think for me, one of the reasons I'm always engaged and always excited about going into the gym is because I'm seeking out more knowledge and then I'm taking that knowledge and trying to apply it. So if I'm listening to a Bill Hartman uh, YouTube video or podcast, I'm thinking about what Bill's talking about and then I'm going to go in the gym and see how that applies to the people that I work with. Right? Don't just sit there and learn stuff just to, to recite it on an internet forum. Take this knowledge, take the things that you're learning, and then immediately try and find ways to make it applicable to what you're doing in the gym. So you got to continue to educate yourself. Keeps your brain engaged, and it helps you continue to grow and evolve. 
Number seven, the Nick Little Hales sleep rule. Okay. So if you're unfamiliar with Nick, Nick is what I consider to be one of the foremost experts on sleep and not maybe sleep science, but really applying practical strategies to sleep. Because I think there's a lot of people that probably have read a lot of research and recited some great stuff. But man, when we're talking about practical application, Nick Little Hales is arguably the best. Uh, so I'll make sure I link his podcast and his book in the show notes. If you haven't listened to them, if you haven't read the book, by all means, please do that. But one thing that Nick talks about is the 35 sleep cycles per week. Okay, so let's start with a quick definition. Nick defines a sleep cycle as an hour and a half of sleep. So if you look in, you know, over an hour and a half, you get all of the various stages of sleep in that hour and a half period. I don't remember what all of them are. Light, deep, REM, whatever, whatever they are, all four of them are in there. I knew at one point in time. So you take that hour and a half and now you figure out how many sleep cycles you get in a night. So let's say you sleep six hours you would get four sleep cycles in that night. If you get seven and a half hours, you'd get five. If you sleep nine, you get six, okay? So let's go back to our example early on. During the middle of the week, maybe you only get six hours of sleep a night, okay? Like that's not great because across seven days, what is that? Or sorry, four sleep cycles. Four sleep cycles a night times seven nights, that's 28. That's not the 35 that we're looking for. So how can we hedge that bet? How can we get more sleep cycles in? Well, a couple ways we can do it are sleep, uh, like naps, midday, sleep obviously, but naps, right? Nick talks about a 30 minute, sometimes as long as an hour and a half, that's probably more for the professional athlete side of this where they have those longer midday naps. But like a 30 minute nap, middle of the day, counts as a sleep cycle. On the weekends, instead of getting that six hours, can you get seven and a half? Can you get nine, right? So this way you're not so focused on the one day, oh man, I only got six hours of sleep. I know I'm going to be awful today. No, like if you're getting that 35 hours or excuse me, those 35 sleep cycles across a week, it makes a huge impact. So now you're not so focused on that one day. It's more about how you manage your sleep cycles across an entire week. And I know for me, this made a huge difference because there are certain times in my life where there's just a lot going on. You know, I'd love to be in bed at 1030 uh, up at six, but it's not feasible, especially like when I created the complete coach cert, man, I was grinding, like I'm coaching all day. I'm working on the, the cert and the slides and everything else at night. So there were a lot of nights I wouldn't go to bed till midnight, but I'd be up at six. So I'm only getting those four sleep cycles that night, but I know, Hey man, I got a break in the middle of the day. I'll try and get a 30 minute nap or man, I know this weekend's slow. I'm going to try and get two consecutive, like nine hours so six, six sleep cycles on those nights, man, it just really sets your mind at ease and it allows you some freedom to know like, hey, look, you know, if you want to do something fun or if you want to go out or there's an event, hey, that's great. You know, go do that thing. But then try and find ways throughout the rest of the week to plug those holes, take a nap, get more rest on the weekends, like finding a way to get those 35 sleep cycles per week will absolutely help keep your energy levels up. And it's going to help you avoid that crash or that burnout that would inevitably happen if you're constantly running on four or five or six hours of uh, four or five, six hours of sleep every single night. OK, one more weekly agenda item. And this is something that I've really focused in on more now that we have kids. But you got to find ways to re-energize yourself on your weekends. Uh, and there's lots of ways you can do this. I would challenge you to figure out what works for you things that work for me personally. Uh, before we had kids, I was not a pizza guy. Like, you know, if I had pizza once or twice a year, it was not a big deal. Now, if you listen to this show and you follow kind of the evolution uh, over the six or so years we've been recording the podcast, pizza movie night is like a staple for the Robertson family. So we love to either go to our favorite pizza place and then go to the movies, or we'll get carry out or a frozen pizza. We'll have that here and then we'll go in the basement and watch a movie. But man, Pizza movie night is the best because I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about coaching sessions. I'm not thinking about emails. I'm just thinking about, hey, man, this is time with my family. Like, I love to chill out. I love to spend time with my family. So pizza movie night is a great energy recharger for me. Uh, 
it sounds weird, but like coaching kids in sports, whether it's my kids, other people's kids, like that actually revs me back up a little bit because I just love helping kids. Like there's nothing more inspiring or anything more fun than watching a little kid that maybe can't throw very well or can't hit very well. And you teach them some mechanical things and they go from, you know, whiffing every time to now they're just crushing a baseball. Like that is so satisfying to me. So it's different than what I do in a gym with a professional athlete. It feels, it's not that working with those high level athletes isn't fun or it's not authentic. It's just, there's this, this innocence to working with our youth and helping build them both physically and emotionally that I get so much out of. So that's a huge energy recharger for me. And then the final one is what I just call the chill zone. Uh, so finding things that that work to help me relax, recharge. Sometimes it's going for a walk with the dog. No, no headphones in. The phone is not on me. It's just me and the dude taking a walk around the block. That does it. Um, sometimes it's just chilling out and watching a basketball game. Like, what works for me may not work for you, but you have to find things that allow you to recharge your battery on the weekends so that when the week hits, you're at a high level again. You know, I just think of it like a gas tank, right? Inevitably, as your week goes on, your energy tank is going to get depleted. So you got to find ways to use your weekend to fill that energy tank back up. So at the start of the week, when Monday morning hits, you're locked in and you're ready to go. So let's bring this together here. We've talked daily or short-term items. We've talked weekly items. Now let's talk about just kind of big picture philosophical items. And let's talk about some things I think you need to do on a semi-regular basis to perform at the highest level. So when we're talking about philosophy, and I don't think this is philosophy because you need to act on it, but you have to surround yourself with like-minded people and people who bring you joy. Now, I know that's kind of wordy, so I'm going to say it again. You got to surround yourself with like-minded people and people who bring you joy. And I'm a big believer in the quote, rising tides lift all boats. When you're around the right people, everything feels easier. It's got more energy behind it. It's got more juice. It's easier to get stuff done. So professionally, you know, I got work married to like the best possible person, right? Like Bill Hartman, could I imagine being around somebody intellectually that's going to push me more? Absolutely not. Like, absolutely not. I don't know who would push me more than him. So it's amazing. I've got Bill. I've got my kind of extended network, Luca, Andy, Joel. I mean, Eric Cressy to some extent, like being around these people, communicating with these people, having them in my inner circle constantly pushes me. It constantly forces me to want to grow and evolve. And not just because I feel the need to catch up. It's because they're so excited about the things they're into. It gets me excited. And then I want to go learn about it. So I've got, you know, these professional people in my inner circle. If I widen that circle a little bit, the people that come on this show, like go back and look at the last year of this show. There have been some amazing people on here. When I think about Paul Comfort, when I think about Courtney Connolly, Ebony Rio, Drake, uh, Aaron Cunanan, um, Ben Ashworth, like I could go on and on and on. I, I'm sure there are great people. Joel, Lee, these great people that I have on here, I listen to them and they're so passionate talking about knees or feet or force plates or isometric mid-thigh pulls. Like, how can I not be excited about those things? How can I not want to learn more? So surround yourself with great people, people that are aspiring to be more. You know, personally, I've got the most amazing compassionate, caring wife on the planet. You know, she supported me in all these crazy dreams and aspirations I've had, like owning a gym and, you know, starting all the things that I've, that I've tried to do and accomplish. Like she's been there. She's rocked with me that whole time. My kids, I have the most amazing children. Just looking at them every day makes me want to be the best possible dad, coach, human being that I possibly can. Like I'm surrounded by great people 24-7, 365. So it's easy to want to level up and you need to challenge yourself. Are you around the right people? Are they pushing you to get better, right? My athletes, you know, when I'm around these athletes at every level, high school, college, pro that want to get to the next level, that have these huge audacious dreams and goals, man, I'm fired up just thinking about it. So my question for you is this, who's in your inner circle? Who's rocking with you? And not just by default, right? Who are the people 
that you have handpicked, that you've chosen, you said, this is somebody I need in my life. They're going to make me better. And in turn, I'm going to make them better. Because if you look at your inner circle and it's not tight enough, it's a problem, right? You get loose, you get the wrong people involved. Now, all of a sudden, you're not getting the absolute most out of your life. You're not getting what you deserve out of your life. So start to think about that. Surround yourself with great people who bring you joy. Last but not least, vacations and time away. Man, I love my gym. I could be in the gym, coaching, queuing, writing programs, five, six days a week, most days out of the year. But I can't do it forever. And I definitely couldn't do it when I was just getting started. Let me tell you about my first year or two of coaching. So I get out of grad school, right? I really want this first job. Like I need a job because I went like five, six months where I couldn't find a job. I'm substitute teaching at my old like middle and high school and living with my parents. <laughs> this, is, this is a great story. Like I'll, I'll give you the whole story later on, but just imagine Jess and I are living together now. I can't find a job. So she goes back, lives with her parents. I'm living with my parents. I'm substitute teaching. I'm putting my resume to every corner of the United States of America, trying to get a job and getting absolutely zero interviews. So starting to get nervous. This first job offer comes up and I'm like, yep, I'm taking it. Now, one of the downsides to this job was, oh, you know, you got to sign a three-year deal. Oh, and by the way, for the first year, an entire calendar year, you get zero vacation. Not like, like none, like zero days of vacation. So thinking back, this is like the worst deal ever. But the worst part is in years two and three, I get one week. Okay. Now, timing is everything in life, my friend. Timing is everything. So when I sign this contract, right, I can't take a vacation the first year. But what's worse is Jess and I are getting married the second year. And our honeymoon isn't until the end of my second year of my contract. So I go almost two full calendar years with zero vacations. I can't imagine how atrocious my coaching probably was as a result of that because I'm not re-energizing myself, right? You have to take time away from the gym to recharge your own batteries. And I think it's very, very important in life to have things outside of work that you look forward to. Like, I love my job. I love owning a gym. I love coaching my clients and athletes. I love all the challenges that come with that. But it's really cool to have things just in real life, IRL, that you're excited about. So in my life, I've always got like these certain things that I'm looking forward to. Uh, in the spring, I love going on spring break. I love going to Florida with the kids. Uh, we go with my best friend from college. His kids are about my kid's age. We all get along. We all have similar interests. I probably laugh more in that week than I do in the two or three months leading up to it. And it's not that I don't laugh a lot during the day, but man, we just have so much fun. And, you know, just it's fun reconnecting, seeing their family, seeing their kids grow up. So I love that. In the summer, we do a dude's trip. Me, my buddy Wes, and my other buddy Bo, we go to Wes's lake house and we just decompress for like two days, which is awesome. I come back and I probably have de-aged myself about six months just from not thinking about work, anything else, all the stressors that come with life. Um, pretty much every summer, we do some sort of family vacation. So this year, we're actually renting a lake house at my buddy Wes's uh, same lake, so we can go hang out with them for four or five days in the summer. In the fall, we go on fall break. We'll go to, you know, in the past we've gone to Florida, but I wanna show my kids there's more to life in the world than Indiana and Florida. So last year we went out west for the first time, showed them the mountains, showed them what Colorado looks like. This year we may go to Nevada or Utah. So the fact of the matter here is this, right? You can love your job. You can love working with people. You can love coaching and all of the great things that come from that, but you have to find time for yourself, right? You have to carve out dedicated time for yourself, your family, your friends, your loved ones, your significant others, because they deserve that from you as well. And I think that's something that, that took me a long time to figure out is that, look, man, pouring yourself into your work is great. And I couldn't imagine not having a career that I'm passionate about. But with that being said, when I have a better balance between work and home, when I'm giving equal effort and energy to my kids, to my wife, to the people in my life 
outside of work, ultimately my work life is better as a result. So, man, I realize this is probably a little bit longer show. <laughs> Definitely longer for me, considering this is my second time recording it, but I really hope it was valuable for you because I feel like learning how to manage your energy, avoiding burnout, these are things, these are discussions we need to be having in our industry. And man, I'm just telling you, 23 years in, I've had some highs, a lot of highs, a lot of really great moments, but I've had some lows as well. So if this show helps you better navigate your coaching career, if it helps you avoid some of those really low, low bottoms that I've dealt with over the years, then I hope it has been impactful for you and it's going to help make a difference in your career going forward. So I really got two favors to ask. At this point, number one, if you're not subscribed to the show, please go ahead and do that right now iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store. Now on YouTube podcast as well. Wherever you consume podcasts, go there right now. Hit the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. Second, if this show hit home with you, if it resonated with you, or if you have a fellow coach, trainer, rehab professional, you know that looks like their energy is low. They're maybe on the cusp of burning out or maybe wanting to leave the industry because they're not managing their energy efficiently. Please share this episode with them. Like I said, man, I'd like to think I've seen a lot in my 23 years. I've had some struggles of my own. And man, if you share this episode with them, I hope it helps them just better manage their own energy and understand that, man, a lot of the things that we we start off with or the, the ideas and the preconceived notions we have about how to be a coach, right? Oh yeah, I just, I never sleep, I crush caffeine all day, I just go. Like those things that we think make for high level coaching early on, long-term just really don't pan out. They don't hold water. So if you could share this with somebody that you think would be, uh, that would benefit from this episode, I would truly appreciate it. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.